So what I'm gonna do now is, let's talk about convalescent, pl convalescent plasma or passive antibody transfusion or infusion or whatever you wanna call it. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Richard Migliori, who is the Chief Medical Officer, CMO of United Health Group. And he says that developing therapeutics and effective treatments for COVID-19 is essential to our efforts to fight this pandemic. Treating patients with convalescent plasma has the potential to save many lives and we're honored to collaborate with Mayo Clinic in this case, they're the ones doing this clinical trial. We'll get into the di different clinical trials going on in a second and support this promising research. Now, Min, based on that, uh, based, oh, do you have the clicker? Uh, I do not have it, I think the clicker, it's right there. Uh, it's right next to me, I'm sorry. So based on what you just read there, tell me how, new is this idea of convalescent, convalescent plasma. I mean, I think this is kind of something new that um, I've recently kind of read on a few, few articles that some researchers are trying to work on to plan to help treat this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it could very well be something that could be a positive thing that will help out if, if they can have enough studies to, to see if it works. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have as much knowledge on it yet myself, mm -hmm. and I haven't been exposed to it anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, we can, if we can think of anything that, I mean, you know, reverse using plasma, uh, I mean, I think that's a great way to try to introduce a different, you know, avenue to try to treat this. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna, you, you don't have a lot of knowledge on it yet. Not yet. But I'm hoping to learn you something. Learn I'm me. hoping to. I'm ready. Okay, mm -hmm. so the answer, simple answer to the question is, you think it's relatively new? Absolutely. Okay, good. So with that said, we'll move down here. So what is it and how does it work? Okay, so you have anatomical and physiological barriers that exist within our bodies, right? You have skin, right. that's your first barrier to mm -hmm. any infection, mm -hmm. right? You have ciliary clearance, mm -hmm. so you have the bronchus, the, no, the nose, the nose. Uh, the, all of the airways have these cilia, these hair-like structures, right, that help to remove mm. things like that mm. that don't belong there. You have a very low pH in your stomach should you ingest something like that. And you have, of course, enzymes in tears and saliva. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we all know this already, right? This is very basic stuff, but I just right. want to lay the foundation if I can. And then you have your innate immunity. Mm -hmm. Innate immunity is essentially what we're born with, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the natural killer cells, you have the neutrophils, you have eosinophils, you have the macrophages, you have the dendritic cells. Mm -hmm. All of these are cellular innate immunity. Now, humoral is of course your complement, uh, your, your, your basically your, uh, your, your, uh, uh, your, inflammatory mediator mm -hmm. processes. Um, your, you have, of course, lectin, you have antimicrobial peptides, you have CRP or C-reactive protein, so that's humoral. Then you have your adaptive immunity, what you're not born with, right. but you develop adapting to the various different antigens that, get it, it, that, that make their way inside of your body, right? Mm -hmm. The cellular are the T cells and the B cells. And of course, we've heard a lot about IgG, right? right. Immunoglobulin G and there's M and there's all these right. various different ones. IgG is the one they're looking for to say you had uh, uh, previously had an infection of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And then of course you have the humoral, which is the actual development of the antibodies, Antibody. okay? And that's where the IgG is gonna live. So, Here's another simple representation, if you will, of the innate immunity, which essentially reacts within hours, immediately to within hours. 
and just kind of shows the progression of how long it takes for the adaptive immunity to take hold. So it goes from hours to some anomaly, dude. It got hot for some reason, who knows, or got overwhelmed and decided to shut down. One day we'll get a new one. Oh, good. Hey, welcome back. Sorry about that. We had a little bit of a technical glitch, uh, but the, uh, the master craftsman over there got it fixed. Uh, that box over there, it has so much in the way of uh, graphics capability and stuff that they do. They push it to the limit and it gets hot. And we have, if you ever came to our studio, which we welcome you to, we have air conditioners blowing on it. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive at how warm all that stuff gets. But getting back to this, you have the innate immunity, yeah, then you have, of course, your uh, your adaptive immunity and the hours going into days before the adaptive immunity really kicks in. Now, this article, I think, is very interesting. And I'm actually going to go to this one first. So I'm going to go backwards. So if you look at this article, what's the date on that, Min? Uh, the date is 2005? 2005. 2005. Wow. 2005 mm -hmm. in London... That's UK, convalescent, convalescent whole blood plasma and serum in the prophylaxis of measles. Wow. So they were looking at using convalescent plasma to help protect kids from getting the measles. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is something people have been thinking about for a while. A long time. But wait, it gets more interesting than that. Okay. So I'm going to go back now to another article. The use of the serum of convalescence in the treatment of influenza pneumonia, a summary of the results in a series of 101 cases. Wow. Dr. Sanborn, George P. Sanborn. Men, what's the date on that one? June 8th, 1920. 1920. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, you'd think I'd stop there. You'd think I wouldn't go any further. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's still farther to go. So. Let me tell you, in 1934, a doctor at a private boys' school in Pennsylvania tried a unique method to stave off a potentially deadly measles outbreak. Mm -hmm. Dr. J. Roswell Gallagher extracted blood serum from a student who had recently recovered from a serious measles infection and began injecting the plasma into 62 other boys who were at high risk of catching the disease. Mm -hmm. Only three students ended up contracting measles, even though we know measles is highly contagious. Okay, okay. it's very contagious. Okay. And all were mild cases. The method, while relatively novel, was not new to science. In fact, the very first Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded in 1901. Wow. Okay, 1901 to Emil von Behring for his life-saving work developing a cure for diphtheria. Of course, we know that's a bacterial uh, infection mm -hmm. that was particularly fatal in children. Mm -hmm. His groundbreaking treatment known as diphtheria antitoxin worked by injecting sick patients with antibodies taken from animals who had recovered from the disease. Wow. So I'll show you a picture, mm -hmm. but he would actually inject, uh, 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 like, uh, what do they call those things? Those, not, not, not rats, but the, uh, like- Mice? Mice? No, guinea pigs, guinea pigs guinea yes. Pigs. Guinea pigs, yeah. That's where the term guinea, pig, guinea, pigs, guinea right? pigs, guinea yeah, pigs, yeah, comes from. With diphtheria, mm -hmm and then take the serum or the plasma from the survivors. Wow. So he knew he gave them the disease and they survived, they, recovered, yeah. they would have antibodies. Anybody. So it was animal antibodies from the plasma being given to from the, plasma. the patients, wow. exactly. Amazing. Von Behring's antitoxin wasn't a vaccine as I just described, but the earliest example of a treatment method called convalescent plasma that's being resurrected as a potential treatment for COVID-19. Wow. Convalescent plasma is blood plasma extracted from an animal or human patient who has convalesced or recovered from infection with a particular disease. 
According to Warner Green, who was the director for the Center for HIV Cure and Research at the Gladstone Institute, that's out in San Francisco, convalescent plasma has been used throughout history when confronting an infectious disease where you have people who recover and there's no other therapy available. I think that's what's very important right here. We don't have a vaccine. Not yet for this. We don't know if um, res remdesivir is, is really going. We gave it to the, our patient, right? The mm -hmm. one that we had with the COVID. Right. Uh, and he did do well, he but did. was did the remdesivir really clear the virus or not? I really don't, don't know. know yet, yeah. We haven't done the hydroxychloroquine yet with the azithromycin. I think some people are. Some then there's mixed mixed results. Mm -hmm. We don't know. There's never been a large study for this. Mm -hmm. Essentially, there's nothing available. But I think that has stoked a tremendous amount of fear. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that convalescent plasma is not a good idea. I don't know. Um, it seems to make sense. But let's explore it a little further. Okay. Let's, let's do that. Convalescent plasma interacts, interacts differently with the immune system than a vaccine does. When a person is treated with a vaccine, their immune system, in particular their adaptive immune system, of course, actively produces its own antibodies that will kill off any future encounters with the target pathogen. That's called active immunity. Convalescent plasma offers what's called passive immunity, which is actually the title of this talk, right? The body doesn't create its own antibodies, but instead borrows them from another person or animal who has successfully fought off the disease. Unlike a vaccine, the protection doesn't last a lifetime, but the borrowed antibodies can greatly reduce recovery times and even be the difference maker between life and death. Convalescent plasma is the crudest of the immunotherapies. Very important point to remember, but it can be effective. Mm -hmm. Some believe that convalescent plasma treatments cut Spanish flu fight fatalities in half. Now, let me tell you a little something about Spanish flu, mm -hmm. okay? Spanish flu worldwide, there were about 50 million um, uh, afflicted, right? Mm -hmm. Death rate or death totals in the United States were somewhere around 675 to 700,000, right? Mm -hmm. It was a huge number. A That's a lot of people oh, to yeah. die from the Spanish flu. There is very serious speculation unproven, but very serious speculation that because Bayer, the aspirin people, mm -hmm. promoted the use of aspirin in mega doses as a potential cure for Spanish mm -hmm. flu, mm -hmm. about estimated 50% of the deaths associated with the Spanish flu were from the ill effects caused by salicylate uh, 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 intox intoxication or toxicity. Mm -hmm. Massive pulmonary edema, they had frothy exudate, mm -hmm. they had cerebral hemorrhage, mm -hmm. overall bleeding, coagulopathies, all kinds of problems. But everything, electrolyte disturbances, the rapid breathing from the, from, the, from the acidosis and alkalosis, both going one way and then the other. So all the things that happen when you have oxygen, I mean, uh, aspirin uh, induced, toxicity, right. induced toxicity, toxicity, you end up with death when you take as much as they were recommending. Right. I'll tell you something else that's, that's interesting. interesting. That's it interesting. is, that's bare, the aspirin right. people. Right. Now, they've saved a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. By, you start having chest pain, you take some aspirin, to antiplatelets save, save you. Mm -hmm. So they've saved a lot of lives too. But I'll bet, I wonder if you can do that. I wonder if anybody in the audience do this. Do you know that bare in World War I is who created mustard gas? I did not know that. They did. Mustard gas, wow. Mm -hmm. Do you know that, so those mustard gas during the war, mm -hmm. There was overdosing everybody on uh, aspirin mm -hmm. in the Spanish flu mm -hmm. epidemic pan pandemic. pandemic. Do you know what else Bear created? What else? Zyklon B. Zyklon B. Zyklon B. For those of you who don't know what Zyklon B was, it was this material that was in. There were little like little uh, round pellets mm -hmm. in a canister. And the Germans, the Nazis at the concentration camps would get on the top, the roof 
of the uh, showers mm -hmm. and they would open the vent up, pour it in, the humidity would release the poisonous gas and then it would kill everybody that was in the shower. Wow. And that's how they killed mass, ex mass extermination of the Jews during World War II. So Bear has had a very storied past. Wow. But then they made Trasolol. Of course, that's been taken off the market. Mm -hmm. I think that was a good drug though. I do think Trasolol was a good drug. After von Bering's antitoxin was distributed worldwide to treat diphtheria in 1895. Wow. Now, why am I saying that so? 1895, that's okay? That means that 125 years mm -hmm we have been looking at convalescent plasma. But when you listen, it sounds like it just happened yesterday. Right, Somebody, well, man, convalescent plasma, this is a brilliant idea. It's been around for a hundred, actually started in 1890, wow. I'll show you that, uh, 1890, yeah. So it's actually 130 years. 130 years. But I'm not gonna make a fuss over five years. But since that time in 1895, doctors experimented with the same passive immunity technique for curing measles, mumps, polio, and influenza. During the pandem pandemic influenza outbreak of 1918, known as the Spanish flu, fatality rates were cut in half for patients who were treated with blood plasma compared to those who weren't. The method seemed particularly effective when patients received the antibodies in the early days of their infection, another very good key point, before their own immune systems had a chance to overreact and damage vital organs. Again, that's the cytokine storm we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. See it mostly in younger people. In the 1930s, doctors like Gallagher, which I talked about earlier from the school, right, used convalescent plasma effectively against measles. By the 1940s and 1950s, antibiotics and vaccines began to replace the use of convalescent plasma for treating many infectious disease outbreaks. But the old fashioned method came in handy yet again during the Korean War, when thousands of US troops were stricken with something called Korean hemorrhagic fever, also known as hantavirus. hantavirus. With no other treatment available, Field doctors transfused convalescent plasma to sickened patients and saved untold numbers of lives. In fact, convalescent plasma has even been deployed against recent outbreaks of, of MERS, SARS, and Ebola, all novel viruses that spread through communities with no natural immunity, no vaccine, and no effective antiviral treatment. Wow. Today, the best treatment for Ebola is still a pair of monoclonal antibodies. Basically what you do is you can take a patient who is convalesced, convalesced. take their plasma and give it, but you can also extract the antibodies from the plasma of multiple people and you can put it into a medication infusion, a suspension of some sort, mm -hmm. and then give that. So you have hyperimmune globulin, which is what that is, that is right. or you take convalescent plasma and infuse that into the patient. We could talk a little bit more about that as I go on. I'll kind of show some examples of that. Um, and then clone, so you basically take them and clone them artificially in a lab. One of the best known modern uses of convalescent plasma is for the production of antivenom to treat deadly snake bites. Wow. Antivenom is made by injecting small amounts of snake venom into horses and allowing the horse's immune system to produce antibodies that neutralize the poison. That's why they call it giving you the horse, the, the horse, uh, 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 serum. horse serum. Horse serum. Horse serum. That's why they call antivenom mm -hmm. horse serum. Exactly. These equine antibodies are isolated, purified, and distributed to hospitals as antivenom. In March 2020, doctors at Johns Hopkins University began testing convalescent plasma as a promising stopgap treatment for COVID-19 while the search continued for a permanent vaccine. The advantage of convalescent plasma is that it can be drawn from recovered patients using the same plasma separation technology used at blood banks. So this is my question, mm -hmm. okay? We saw during the latest uh, episode in New York, which was very severe, right? 
that they were running out, they thought they were gonna run out of ventilators, they thought they were gonna run out of beds, they thought they were gonna run out of a whole bunch of things. But if this works as a stopgap measure, and I think this is really kind of my point, Min, mm -hmm. is if we've been doing this for 130 years, okay, you look at that picture, it's from 1890. Mm -hmm. Guinea pigs. And, yep, the guinea pigs, and it's Dr. Baring right there, Von Baring, mm -hmm. injecting the uh, guinea pig with the diphtheria to make the plasma from, okay? And it hasn't taken hold as a front line. Why are we doing clinical trials? Right. Why are, I don't understand why we're doing clinical trials. I mean, it's a virus. We know how it works. We know what the process is. Those processes aren't gonna change. Why are these becoming, why are these clinical trials? Why are we just not doing it? Why have we not already started synthesizing it and, and, and doing the, the hyperimmune globulin? Why are we sitting here doing this with convalescent plasma? Because I'm gonna show you some things. Giving people plasma is not benign right. by any stretch of the mm -hmm. imagination, okay? Mm -hmm. But anyway, there's Dr. Baring, 1890. Here's the, here's the uh, medics giving a, a, a soldier convalescent plasma uh, on the front lines or you know, behind the front lines in a medical station uh, in Korea in August of 1950, okay? Here we see a physician in uh, China who, is, who uh, recovered from COVID-19, who is being uh, giving blood in order to make wow. the convalescent plasma, okay? Wow, that's great. It is. And then there's Chen. This article, um, and this article is from, uh, where was this published? This was published in JAMA, yes, just recently. So March 27, 2020. So you see up there on the top left, this is treatment of five critically ill patients with COVID-19 uh, with convalescent plasma. And you see in the top left, you have coronavirus uh, 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 patients that recovered. Then you have five critically ill patients and uh, they had AR, you know, ARDS. Mm -hmm. They were given the, the, the plasma, and you see that four of the five patients had their, their SOFA score uh, decreased within three days, and their PAO2, FIO2 ratios increased within 12 days. Wow. Their viral loads did decrease, and their SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody titers increased. Three of the patients were discharged from the hospital the other two are in stable condition, still in the hospital, 37 days after transfusion. I, I'm not 100% convinced, and this is a, maybe a, a, a little better, uh, easier to read, but it basically explains it to you there. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not 100% convinced that, you know, after 12 days um, and 37 days, I don't know, very small, really? very small, small uh, quartile, size. very small sample size, extremely small. I don't think that this necessarily tells me anything. Not enough data yet. I don't think so. I don't think so. I still think commonsensically, it makes sense. It makes sense to try it. Yes, absolutely. But I think you have to be prudent. But I still think you're a lot better off taking the multiple, taking and cloning the antibodies and then infusing them in patients as a concentration versus giving just the plasma. I agree. I, that's what I think. I'm not sure why, well, I think I do know why. So what are the risks? Well, they can range from mild fever to allergic reaction. You can have bronchospasm, which can be quite severe. Mm -hmm. You can develop trally or transfusion related acute lung injury from a plasma transfusion. And you can, of course, have circulatory overload with larger volumes. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Now, the doses they're giving are about 200 to 300 mLs of plasma, so it's not that much. Um, that's you know a unit, maybe a unit and a half, maybe on a good day. So, so um, it's, 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 a, it's not really a it's, lot. It's, it's, a, it's a subsequent daily dosage. Yes, they have to get. yes, they do. They give them multiple doses, yes. And I'd have to go back. I, I do have some of the protocols, mm -hmm. um, but and I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. You're getting more than one dose. 
it's probably cheaper. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. The question is, when they were running out of all those beds, could perfusion with a simple cell saver, which so is nothing more we, than- We can separate plasma easily on this. Should we, you know, could we have been on the front lines doing that right there right. at the bedside right. and having it done quickly? Right. And waiting, should we? Waiting for the lab to process it and whatnot. Right, that takes forever. Mm -hmm. We can create it really fast. Mm -hmm. At the bedside. And if you really had to do it fast, that's the best way to do it. Oh, yeah. I think that's a use for that's, the- Especially in a place like New York when they're overwhelmed with all the- Correct. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. we, you know, they were, they were on, whether right, wrong, or indifferent. I, I, don't, I don't want to debate the politics of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. But they were clearly on a wartime fitting. Of course. Or footing, wartime footing. When you looked at that picture, go back and look at that picture of those soldiers, that didn't look like a very aseptic area. <laughs> Not at all. Okay, and they're sticking mm -hmm. needles in people's veins mm -hmm. and they're running plasma in and God knows what the storage of that stuff was. Uh, but you're on a wartime footing. You do what you have to do in Great. the circumstances. I think if it had gotten to that point and you really needed, I just still don't understand why they're doing clinical trials. In my view, clinical trials are done. Right. They've been done. Right. Maybe not for SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. but they've been done for a whole bunch of other bunch reasons. Of reasons right? We know that it seems to work. Right. To what degree, I'm not 100% sure. But I think we know what the risks are. So I find it fascinating that it's become a research project and not just, let's just do this, it makes sense. Right. I mean, especially with the overwhelming numbers of people getting sick, getting it, getting infected and dying every day. Yeah, uh, that's how I feel, exactly. Especially like in New York and places like that. Yes, As, well, you know, should you give it to, of course, you know, they can get into philosophical debate, but should you give it to somebody who's 92 years old from a nursing home? Should you? Or should you reserve it for the 56 year old with a family at home? Well, if you're in a place in New, where you, in New York where you have multiple, a lot, so many patients that are mm -hmm. already positive, then you have multiple patients you can extract the plasma from and, and mm -hmm. concentrate it. So versus, you know, a city like Houston, we don't have as many patients on ECMO mm -hmm. where we could extract as much. Well, they don't have to be on ECMO. Right. They just have to. I mean, to not have, ECMO, I'm sorry, but, but with the COVID. Yeah, positive. this is true. This, this is, true. is true. So, so here's some of the things that you need. Well, I asked the question: Could auto transfusion, you know, supplement the blood banks and use cell savers, and that should be used U.S.E to uh, process plasma. There are several clinical trials ongoing, including one here in Houston, Texas at the Houston Methodist Hospital. Well, you know about that one, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there is seemingly a lack of really large trials and there is a hesitancy for some reason to just use it. Again, it, I find it fascinating as far as I'm concerned. I still don't understand why there's a trial. So which is the most effective formulation is the question. Convalescent plasma, well, they're donor-dependent variabilities. Every donor, just because you survived COVID, doesn't mean that your plasma is necessarily the same quality as somebody else's. That's true. So you have donor-dependent variability that you cannot avoid and get rid of, okay, or ignore. Then you have the leading edge of infectious waves. So if you're in a position where you're giving this at the leading edge of that infectious wave, you're probably not gonna have enough of it, right? Right. We talked a little bit about the HIG, the hyperimmune immunoglobulin or hyperimmune globulin, and then blended. So my view is we should have been producing this stuff, taking any patient that survived it, mm -hmm. cloning their their, their antibodies, creating this HIG, having it processed rapidly and available, and giving that as a first line. If you wanted to use convalescent plasma with it, or maybe first to see what would happen, then do a blended program. We talk about blended programs all the time, mm -hmm. and blended programs seem to work very well. I think they're very effective. Mm -hmm. So I think we needed to be, you know, we need to be realistic. Do you have enough donors? What do you do with donor-dependent variability? Then what do you do when donors, potential donors don't want to donate for some reason, mm -hmm. for whatever the reason may be, so you may not have enough. And if you're on the leading edge of the infectious wave, are you gonna have enough donors 
in the very beginning to treat the patients as they're coming in and it takes time for them to build. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna lose ground by not having it readily available. Mm -hmm. That's, I guess my point, mm -hmm. is you should have it ready in the early stages, right? Which is like way back in December, January. Correct. Right? Should have gotten it immediately. The very first patient that they were able to extract some from, do it from as many patients as you could, get it into the lab, clone it, develop high concentration antibodies that will work, you know, whatever that suitable amount is, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know what the right amount would be, mm -hmm. but create this hyperimmune globulin formula mm -hmm. to give patients so you're not depending on the plasma. Key discussion points from my perspective, convalescent plasma therapy is not new. I've shown that from 1890 to 2020, that's 130 years. Mm -hmm. There exists donor variability of antibody titers in all convalescent plasma. Plasma transfusions are not without their own risks. Donor availability and their willingness, I mentioned that just a minute ago. What about religious beliefs? Yeah. Can you give plasma to a Jehovah's Witness? It's not red blood cells, yeah, but can true. you? Some, some, some patients may say yes, some patients may say no. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. How do you explain that to them? That's well, true. it's blood, but it's not blood. Right. It's the clear part of the blood mm -hmm. or the straw colored part of the blood, mm -hmm. but it's got the antibodies in it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have red blood cells. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? I don't know. It'd be a very difficult explanation. Is the HIG more viable solution? Is it a more viable solution for my money? I think it makes a lot more sense. Maybe there's some limitation to creating it. I, it doesn't sound like there is to me. Right. Because they're doing it now. Of course. So they've been doing they've it. They've done it for 130 years. Well, they not the, not the, not the hyperimmune globulin <laughs> where you take it and clone it clone and it. you get it, take it from multiple different donors. Mm -hmm. And that way you have a large load to start with. You can start getting this stuff processed very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a tremendous, tremendous lack of large trials. Given how many years we have looked at this and given how common infection is a problem within our society, viruses of various things, all these different diseases that occur mm -hmm. and how common they are in the human experience, how are we lacking any truly definitive large trials for this technology, this technique, this therapeutic modality all these years later? Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand that. So I'm gonna end there and I'm gonna ask you to tell me what you think the reason is. Um, I think a lot of it probably has to do with, you know, it's, I think, you know, this COVID-19 is something that's, you know, it's the first time we've seen it, you know, it's new. Um, you know, yeah, um, you know, SARS and whatnot, we mm -hmm. had a flu type pandemic before, um, but I think it's the unknown. You know, we don't know exactly how, we don't have a vaccine for it, you know. We haven't, you know, confronted this until this year. And so I think it's the unknown of a lot of places, programs, research centers that are um, looking at targeting on how to um, solve this 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 um, virus, mm -hmm. treat it in, in, in a manner. But um, and maybe we just like you said, we, like we we discussed, we don't have enough data mm -hmm. um, on supporting as far as uh, using plasma and whatnot. But uh, it does make a lot of sense, you know, with the history, given that you know the success that we've had, you know, going back to you know. 1890, 1895. Yeah. Albeit all of it, a lot. I mean, I would say the overwhelming majority, um, certainly the preponderance, but I, I would say lacking large trials, mm. I guess my view is really all of it. It's anecdotal. It, it'd be interesting to, to go back and look at the failures through the years also, like when people have tried it and it hadn't been successful. Mm -hmm. That'd mm -hmm. be interesting to see too. Well, you know, what I find interesting is, is the comment, I don't remember if you remember it in the talk or not, where they said that they believed that the mortality rate from the Spanish flu was cut in half yeah, right. by convalescent plasma. What's that based on? Mm -hmm. It wasn't based on a trial, it okay? It's based on an opinion. Mm -hmm. 
So there's also people that say that the mortality rate associated with the Spanish flu was double because of bear <laughs> yeah. and, you know, salicylate mm -hmm. toxicity. Mm -hmm. So again, we don't have the true numbers to, 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 um, to support that. Well, I think we hear this, mm -hmm. we hear it, other people hear it, mm -hmm. and then the next thing you know, they, they believe it. Right. But again, you have trials going on in Mayo, you have trials going on in New York, you have trial with Chen, which is the one that I put on there. Right, you was, have trials going on in Houston, here at, at Houston Methodist. That was in February. Yes. The, the, the Chen. Yeah, the, the, yeah, exactly. It's so very recent, but uh, with this COVID-19. Yeah. But again, it's not a new technique. It's not. And, and, and again, my, uh, my question, my very, and, and I'm baffled by it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think anybody's gonna be able to really answer my question in a way that I'm satisfied with mm -hmm. the answer is why in the hell are we doing a trial? Mm -hmm. Just use it. Right. Now it's not being used to take, collect the data and let's do at least a retrospective analysis of it with some scientific rigor mm -hmm. after this is all over. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't make any sense. It should be more widely available, right. I guess is my point. Right. Somebody at Community Hospital X should be able to do this mm -hmm. just as well as somebody at UCF, right. okay, why should they only have the opportunity to do it if it has been around for this many years, mm -hmm. okay? That's, I think, where I'm kind of going with mm -hmm. this. And I think it's a matter of these smaller community centers not having the same support of the research-wise mm -hmm. who can uh, think beyond the box of, mm -hmm. you know. Well, but they can give it and they can draw their blood and they yeah. can preserve it and they can do everything mm -hmm. they need to do. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't the community hospital, we should, again, we should. be have access to the bank that has convalescent plasma mm -hmm. or the hyperimmune globulin, one or the other, mm -hmm. um, and be able to treat the patient with that? Because all we can do with COVID-19 is supportive measures, right? right just right like now. H1N1 or influenza B, Sorry, we can't do well, Tamiflu, we have Tamiflu, Absolutely. but basically, if you've passed the time for Tamiflu, it's, not it, it's supportive measures. You go into ARDS, there's no true treatment for ARDS. Right. You have to let it run its course right. and you keep the patient stable with as high an oxygen content as possible. That's why we use ECMO and you mm -hmm. try to reduce the, 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 the ventilatory associated trauma to the lungs and all these things that we do mm -hmm. are supportive in nature. Mm -hmm. So, if, we, if that's all we have, mm -hmm. and you're in dreary, eerie Pennsylvania, why should you not have the same access to a batch of convalescent plasma as they do in Houston, Texas Medical Center? Right. That's my argument. Mm -hmm. Again, if it was brand new, I could see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lacking, however, some compelling Resources. reason or argument mm -hmm. To the contrary, mm -hmm. I think doing a trial now is pointless. That's just my opinion. We're kind of behind the A-ball now. I think you're already behind it. Of course. And if we know it works with diphtheria, if we know it works with measles, if we know it works with influenza, if we know it works, we know it works, then why would it not work now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Prove sense. it later. Now's not the time to be thinking about that. Give it a try, see if it works. Right. And then later we can- Vet it out. And then, and then have, it, have it ready for the next- right. Now it's not without risk. Right, of course. So you can do harm. Mm -hmm. We recognize that. So I think you have to be respectful of that too. But at the end of the day, if that's all you got coming to you, if that's the only chance they're, you got- they're already, they're already, you know- Because a lot of these small community hospitals critical. don't have ECMO. You know, they're already critical too. They're already critical. Yeah, they're going, they're, they're circling. Right. Now, the next question is, will it work as well when you're already circling the drain? It's true, because you might be too late. How early do you need to give it? Right. right. Kind of like ECMO. Timing. On ECMO. Timing. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. Exactly. Right. That's mm -hmm. yet another, that's going to be another confounding issue mm -hmm. with all of these clinical trials. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think it might also be some centers that are treating you know, COVID-19 with whatever resources they have, do you think they're trying the hydroxychloroquine first and not wanting to do both 
even though they might have the resources to do the plasma because you know if they they do both at the same time how do we know how do mm -hmm. they know which one is actually working yes that's true too right so you don't necessarily want to write right poly pharmacology through the whole thing, you know, and have a lot of different therapies. You don't know which one works, throw in the kitchen sink at somebody. I agree with that. I think you need to pick a, pick a treatment and, and go with it. Mm -hmm. But there's, I think a lot of places, uh, again, you know, I'm, I mean, we are very blessed to be in a large metropolitan area with a big, the, 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 the largest medical center in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, access to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. That's not all of the United States. Mm -hmm. I would suggest to you that there's a lot of places who have seen fewer of these patients, but they still have seen them. Mm -hmm. uh, and back in H1N1, we had a lot of 50 year olds and 60 year olds and 43 year olds who were, who, who were, were dying, were on ECMO and extremely sick. Mm -hmm. We had very good success rate. Okay. You know, survival was yeah. about 70% plus mm -hmm. or minus. Uh, for that particular thing it was a rough course for them. Uh, without ECMO, it would, the mortality would have been much, much, much mm -hmm. higher. Probably mortality would have been, or survival would have been down around 30% or possibly even lower. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but not everybody has access to ECMO. Of course. A lot of places don't have access to hydroxychloroquine. A lot of, That's even it. though it's a common drug, they're not, they're, they're, they're not gonna get it. It's, in, it's being, now it's in short supply. There are patients with arthritis and lupus who can't even get their prescriptions filled. Right. And that's not right either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why are they forced to, they're disposable. They're just, they're, 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 they're dispensable, but because we have to save this patient. Well, that doesn't seem doesn't, fair. Doesn't. They were on this medication for years. For years, yeah. The same with the rem, uh, remdesivir, mm -hmm. same thing. Not everybody can get that. Convalescent plasma, however, seems a lot easier to get. It is because you have patients that are that, that, that are positive. Correct. And they you know, and that's why the testing was so important. Mm -hmm. Who's got these antibodies? Get that plasma, freeze it, have it ready to give to patients. Mm -hmm. You know, as an option mm -hmm. to nothing. To nothing, of course. You know. Right? But timing is everything. It is. It is so, absolutely. So anyway, 